we've got everyone or most everybody. Great. All right. Well, thank you. That's a great group. We appreciate everybody being here. Um, we're going to, as I said, we have a full agenda, so we're going to jump right in. One of the um, updates I wanted to provide, especially for our tenants, is this this group and this meeting came out of uh, the port's participation in the AB 617 process, which is working with the South Stockton community to really develop a, um, a commission or a community mission reduction plan uh, that's then submitted to the California Air Resources Board and then funded. Uh, and so that process is ongoing, but through those stakeholder engagement meetings, um, that I participated in, it really uh, came out that we needed to have and be a little bit more uh, in line with with the, the local community. Um, and so we wanted to start this to just have open dialogue to share more about the efforts the port's making, whether it be uh, with zero emission technology and improving air quality for the area, um, but also the other studies that we're doing. And so each each month we kind of go through um, an update. The big focus of this group is really to develop the clean air plan. Uh, and we're doing outreach to tenants and uh, to our employees in that process. We're also working on a zero emission blueprint project through the California Energy Commission, which we've also reached out to tenants. So we wanted to give updates on all of these things um on a monthly basis and then also listen to the community and find out you know what what their interests are and uh ways that we can kind of engage more um another thing we've been doing is providing a lot of tours of the port so i think almost everybody uh who has wanted to from the ab617 group has been able to come out and take tours and see the efforts that we're making um and provide input and feedback on 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 the port operations um Real quickly before we jump into everything, um, I did want to say so another thing we're doing right now is working with uh, the principal at Washington Elementary. We've been over there. We donated some soccer goals. They just started school uh, two weeks ago. Uh, and right now we're holding a clothing drive uh, for the students there. Um, the main needs are plain blue jeans and plain polo shirts. And so we've reached out to our tenants and our employees and asked them to bring items in. Um, we've had a great response so far. We've had uh, one of our tenants who wanted to donate like the 30 backpacks full of school supplies. We've had another one reaching out to try to see if they can help out with a cash donation. Um, but then a lot of folks have been bringing in um, gently used clothes to uh, send to the students um, who, who potentially are in need. Uh, we'll probably do something further once we get into the fall and once the weather starts changing because the, the principal was explaining to us that she sees a lot of her students that are coming in even as the weather changes and they're still wearing you know sandals and you, she knows that they just don't have the resources to um to go out and get additional supplies and shoes and things for the students and so we're trying to provide that um opportunity um Real quick, uh, and, and, and speaking of jobs and job opportunities, one of the things that the principal over there is really holding us to is making sure that we can do a jobs uh, fair for, for the, the families that, uh, of the students over there. So we're, we're, we're socializing that information and all of that out to our tenants, uh, as well as we are finalizing a jobs board that will incentivize tenants to hire from the South Stockton community. So that will be coming out. And I know I've been talking about this for a little while, but it, it is ready to be launched. So you should see that hopefully uh, go live before our next uh, Port Outreach Committee meeting. Then we've got Coastal Cleanup coming up. Um, the official Coastal Cleanup is on September 17th. We, haven't, we don't have a location yet, but we will be sending out information. We had a really successful um, uh, coastal cleanup event that the port and, and environmental justice for water um, put on and we've got a video to show probably the next POC meeting um, so we'll be looking for information about coastal cleanup um, and we also we did have an agenda setting meeting we we didn't have a lot of folks attend um, so then we we circled up with some other folks we talked with Jonathan uh, and the um, his group and so we, we were able to talk through some interests that they have and I'd be willing to do that with with any of anybody else that wants to to meet separately and talk about different agenda items or focus points you'd like to see come out of these meetings so I'll stop there um, 
I know Ellen has got to take off early, and so we were going to have Ellen Priest uh, come up and speak first and give an update on the harmful algal bloom studies that she's working on. Hi, thank you for having me. I just have a, a couple of slides to share. Can everyone see my screen? Okay, great. So um, just a brief background for those of you that haven't attended the last couple of months. Um, I'm working with the city and the Port of Stockton and the Central Valley Water Board to conduct a cyanobacteria harmful algal bloom monitoring project this summer. Um, the purpose of the study is to characterize uh, the temporal and spatial extent of these cyanobacteria harmful algal blooms uh, from the deep water ship channel all the way down to the city. Um, and we're also looking at nutrient dynamics and how uh, those nutrients are potentially fueling these blooms. So this is an 11 um, sampling event project, and we have conducted six of those sampling events to date. We did one in May, um, two in June, two in July, and one so far in August. We've got one more in August, two in September, one in October, and one in November. So the next few slides, I just have it broken up by month to kind of give you an overview of what we've seen um, by month so far. So I'm gonna start in June um, because in May, we, we weren't really seeing uh, very much action. There were some cyanobacteria cells in the water column, but there wasn't much. And so it was uh, in June, really our second sampling event at the end of June that we really started to see um, cyanobacteria in the water column. And I think uh, those of you familiar with the waterfront will recognize uh, these buildings in the picture, but you can see those streaks, like bright green streaks, and that's um, the cyanobacteria that we saw in the water column. What we noticed was that the bloom really started down towards the city. It grew, um, and, and then we saw it uh, traveling down, or what it looked like to be traveling down to the Morelli boat ramp. Uh, in May, we didn't see any microcystis cells in the turning basin, but by June, we did. And then um, by July, we saw cells um, all the way down into the ship channel. So on each of our sampling dates, we are con collecting um, profiles throughout the water column where we're looking at dissolved oxygen and pH and other water quality parameters. We're collecting nutrient samples, and then we're collecting toxin samples. Those toxin samples are shipped off to uh, the University of Santa Cruz, where they run an analysis for microcystin, anatoxin, and cylindrospermopsin. Um, so the first time that we had a toxin detection was on June 23rd, when we saw uh, the cells here in these pictures. Uh, we Interestingly, we did not see any of the toxin detected all the way down at the city by the public um, dock, yet that's where we saw the densest bloom. But we did have a slight detection of microcystin at the Morelli boat ramp, uh, 0 0.48 micrograms per liter. Uh, to put that in context, the, cyanobacter or the California Cyanobacteria Harmful Algal Bloom Network has a recreational caution threshold of 0 0.8 micrograms per liter. So that falls under that threshold. If it had registered at 0 0.8 micrograms per liter or higher, uh, then there would be signs posted stating uh, caution um, to, to let people know that there is a bloom present or that there's toxins present, excuse me. So um, interestingly in July, I, we didn't see that same streaking that I showed you in the June pictures. You could definitely see that cells were present and here on the left-hand side, you know, that piece of water that's kind of isolated from the main portion of the channel was bright green with microcystis. Um, but the main channel, you can see on the other side, the water was quite a bit clearer and we are taking our samples in the main channel, not in that edge habitat there. And then on the right side, this is up by Buckley Cove. Um, so in the ship channel, but near Buckley Cove. And I'm showing you this, the water is green, but those spots, those are clumps of uh, the microcystis cells that you can see floating in the water column. And they're 
on the left, so they're much smaller, um, brighter green. And on the right, we're seeing these up the ship channel further, we're seeing these bigger clumps. They're not accumulating together uh, as much. So in July, um, we only have toxin samples for the first two June events and the first July event. The other July and August event are currently um, being processed. So I only have toxin results for the month of July uh, to present for our July 7th, our first sampling date. And in this case, uh, our only toxin detection was at the public dock. Once again, not that calm or that area where it's bright green, but to the right of that in the main area. Um, and we detected 0 0.24 micrograms per liter. So once again, uh, below that caution threshold set by the cyanobacteria harmful algal bloom network. Moving on to August, uh, once again, our observation was that that late event in June that I showed the pictures in the first slide is where we saw the, the greatest amount of scum throughout uh, the main ship channel area. Um, but we still see some. And so on the left, this is a close up of some of the bloom we saw over by the public dock. And then on the right hand side, um, that's a picture. We're looking at all these samples under the microscope so that we can identify what species are present. And so that's a picture from the microscope. And that's a close up of the microcystis. And then those kind of um, elongated cells, those are diatoms. So the diatoms or the good algae are mixed in with the cyanobacteria. As I said, those samples are undergoing toxin analysis at UC Santa Cruz, uh, but we decided to run a test strip um, to see if any toxin was present. These test strips are good for, um, you know, letting you know if there's toxin present, but they're not currently used by the state um, to inform whether uh, the toxin is above the threshold or not. Um, we need to do some comparisons between the test strips and then the analytical methods that are approved by the state for detecting toxin. Um, but the, the test strip did detect that there was a relatively high concentration of microcystin at the public dock. And so we'll have to confirm that once we get those samples back from UC Santa Cruz, hopefully in the next week or two. Um, so 20 micrograms per liter is identified as a danger threshold by the state of California. So, you know, you're supposed to stay out of the water um, when toxins are that high. But once again, um, it, we can't post that based on um, the test strip. So hopefully we'll get the, the true answer here shortly. It's interesting that the bloom didn't appear to be as dense in August and so, um, my thought is maybe there's multiple strains of microcystis and some of them produce toxins and some of them do not produce toxins. You can't tell by looking at the water columns which ones are toxic or not toxic. And our guess is that perhaps the strains are shifting to a more toxin uh, producing strain at this later date in the summer um, to be determined uh, within the next week or so. We're still in the process of analyzing all the nutrient samples. And so I'm not ready to report on that, but I just wanted to share some pictures and give you a, a general update on what we have found so far in our sampling. So that's all I had to share. That's great. No, and so is there a specific month that in historically the microsystem has been the highest? In 2020, there, I believe it was, there was very high toxin concentrations um, by the Morelli boat ramp and the dock. Um, and in our early July samples, we weren't seeing that high toxin concentration, um, which is why it's so hard to predict and why you can't predict it even by just looking at the water. You really have to, to test and use these testing methods that are um, re reliable and that we can be certain are telling us accurate results. Got it. So yeah. it has seemed to be a little bit cooler of a summer, I think, than the last two years. Um, Hi, Ellen. I'd like to jump in because I think there's a lot. Um, I appreciate the data and I appreciate the work. I really wish you would have partnered with um, Spencer Fern to get the other half of the story because we have been running weekly tests since April. 
Um, and we are sending tests every two weeks to UC Santa Cruz as part of our work with the water boards. And you work with him on all those committees. So there's a lot more data um, that's available. Um, first off, one of the differences between this year and 2018 through 2021 is that even though we've been in drought, we've had late heavy rains in May and June every year. And so those late heavy rains will bring nitrates and, and discharge downstream that gets in the water and then boom, it would heat up in May. This year, not only did we not have the heat early, we didn't have the um, uh, runoff from a heavy May rain. We went dry very early and we didn't see those late May and, and June rains that would have brought discharge downstream. And then you have to remember in 2018, we are uh, 2019, we had um, an event where our sewer system is backed up in Stockton from the wastewater treatment system because of a heavy rain event in late May. And that release that was part reported through the water boards set the stage for a very bad year for harmful algal blooms. Um, we are running at uh, 10 to 20 parts per uh, billion uh, dangerous levels at Morelli Lake, and we have been consistently for three weeks. The test strip data is actually taken in by Cal Water Boards and is used to do preliminary alerts. And then it's the guiding post that we use with them to actually go ahead and do the snatch samples, which we're doing. And then we've also had a harmful algal bloom on and off at American Legion Lake and in Smith Canal. It is back. It was a pretty toxic one as well. Um, the microcystis has been migrating out. Um, you haven't necessarily hit the high danger levels. Um, again, I think it's because I think we didn't get the discharge. And then even though it's been horribly hot, we've had a lot of overcast days. There's impacts from sun as to how those blooms migrate up and down. The second part of the work that we're doing that should be covered in this report is that we are collecting the air sample monitoring. We are under contract now for the University of North Carolina, and there is a study that is being completed with our data and with the water samples to see if the cyanotoxins actually generate PM 2.5 or attach to PM 2.5. Uh, the, the, that testing is being done here in Stockton, Discovery Bay, and Antioch, and we're helping them with all three sets of monitors. And that's going to be really uh, important data because it's going to give us an idea about um, the link between water pollution and air pollution, um, I think, around this. And then I think the last thing that people should really be aware of because it creates and generates pollution is water temperature data. We've been out collecting water temperature data with all of those samples. And um, bottom line is around the port areas, all around the waterfronts in Stockton, we're seeing water temperatures up to 85 degrees. Nothing can live in that. You can kiss your fish populations goodbye. And then um, even in the interior of the Delta on the San Joaquin River system, we're seeing 80 degree temperatures. Uh, which is really problematic for HABs formation and um, just, you know, overall waterway and ecosystem health. And that has to do with how much water is not flowing in and through the estuary with climate change. Hey, Barbara, I just want to chime in that I have spoken with Spencer about this project several times. We haven't spoken in the last couple of weeks, but um, been sharing what I've found and vice versa. Oh, I, I know you are. It'd be good though to report out together though, because I think you'd get a, a more comprehensive um, set of data because we're filling in the blanks where you aren't, but you're out in the middle of it in a boat and we're only doing the boat by Frank's track in, in Antioch. We're not doing the boat here. So I think if we pieced it all together, we'd get a better picture. Definitely. No, and, and that's what I'm, I've spoken to Spencer about utilizing his data as well because you know at the end we'd like to write a report with all of the findings from this summer and definitely want to integrate everything that's being collected this summer so that we can you know do a complete synthesis and have a much better story to tell here in a couple months when I'm able to look at all of the data together. Yep. Thanks Alan. Thanks Barbara. Um, we don't have a lot more time to spend on this but Matt your hands up real quick. 
Yeah, thanks. I'll be quick. I just wanted to flag maybe an opportunity to come uh, on the horizon to collaborate uh, because of the the secondary PM form formation potential that Barbara's team uh, brought to my attention. We've been able to um, rope in a, a some resources from the Department of Toxic Substance Control and through CARBS Enforcement Division to look at that PM formation or whether or not it's hitching a ride on PM and also um, DTSC's wheelhouse is really around um, illegal discharge and, uh, you know, what is it, total dissolved solids in the water, things I don't know anything about, but there are some uh, regulatory agencies coming to town taking a greater interest in this because of our region's, um, you know, non-attainment status of the Clean Air Act under PM 2.5, and the state is writing a new state implementation plan, because uh, we've been breaking the law for 25 years and people think that's normal. So I uh, would like to uh, invite Ellen uh, and, and Barbara, of course, I've already disclosed all of this to her, uh, but uh, one more regulator in the room that we can get to do their job. So thanks for the report out. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. And thank you, Ellen. Appreciate the yeah. input. And sounds like there's opportunities to collaborate and dive deeper each month. So thank you. All right. Next, we're going to go to... Uh, Jason and Katie, do you guys have updates on, on port ongoing projects? Yes, this is Jason. Um, the port currently has two projects underway and that's the rapid response dock and the dock 7-8 repair project. So the rapid response dock project, that replaces the port police's floating dock near dock nine. And what that will do is improve the police operations and response time. And then the dock 7-8 repair project, that's just replacing some fenders and some structural elements on the existing dock 7-8, existing dock 7-8 on the port's east complex. And what this will do is just improve the structural integrity of the dock. And the port is also continuing its planning effort for additional placement sites for beneficial reuse of dredge material to support the channel's maintenance dredging project. So we have made progress coordinating with the Corps and Delta landowners on identifying certain placement sites. And um, you know, we could beneficially use the dredge material for levee maintenance projects or potentially addressing subsidence of the Delta Islands. And the port has um, identified a, a site several months ago and that's on McDonald Island. And we have a CEQA document that's almost ready to be released for public review. And then we have another CEQA document that will just follow that for potential placement sites on Venice Island. So once those are available, we'll let, uh, let everybody know and provide them to you. And that's about all I have, Jeff. Got it, okay. That reminds me, at some point we should have, uh, we should provide an update on what's happening at Antioch Dunes in the, in the near future, maybe have US Fish and Wildlife Service come and talk. Barbara, okay, I see definitely. your hands up. Yeah, just a quick question on the dredge spoils that you're moving out to Venice Island. I'm taking it. It's been through all the analysis it needs to to meet Clean Water Act standards. Yes, the U.S. Corps or yeah, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, they they um, test the sediment prior to placement, and so they in in the channel they will uh, sample the sediment in the channel prior to uh, removing it from the channel and placing it on the islands. Great, thank and the, you. And the water bar approves them, yes. Okay, all right, great. Thanks, Jason, appreciate that. Um, we asked uh, HDR to come tonight to give a real brief uh, update on some of the rail design uh, projects that we're working on. Um, you know, right now, rail infrastructure is a huge focus of the port. Uh, and so we appreciate uh, Mike, uh, Mike Higgins from HDR being here, and I think one of his colleagues as well. Yeah, thanks, Jeff, and good afternoon, everyone, again. So uh, Mike Higgins and our and HDR's transportation group out of uh, Sacramento, uh, Matt Archer, uh, also with HDR, has joined us tonight, who's the, uh, the project manager for this uh, the rail improvements project at the Port of Stockton. I apologize, we don't have any slides to share with you, but just wanted to use this opportunity to give a brief update on uh, where we're at with the project. Um, I believe maybe some of you have heard uh, at past meetings, um, generally about the project itself, but just as a refresher, uh, the Ports Rail Improvements Project um, has a, a track extension within the, the BNSF right-of-way uh, main tracks uh, just east of the East Complex. 
Uh, it extends those port, those uh, rail improvements extend into the ports east and west complex, and they include a, a double track rail bridge across the San Joaquin River, where there's currently one single track bridge, World War II era truss bridge for those of you that have been out there and, and seen it in action. Um, so that project is in the what we call the final design stage, um, where the engineering studies are getting underway right now, where we ultimately put our plan sets together for the railroads to approve and get that project set up ultimately to be constructed um, here in the next couple of years. So we are uh, the reason we're bringing this to you today is with those engineering studies getting underway, which include surveys, topographic surveys, uh, geotechnical soil borings, et cetera. Uh, folks in and around the area uh, may see some heightened activity with our, our, uh, our consultants and vendors out on site uh, getting prepped for those engineering studies. So we just wanted to make sure that folks in the area were aware. And if you saw heightened activity that you'd, you'd have a little background as to what was going on. So um, we just wanted to uh, give that general update to you. Um, happy to answer any questions, but I uh, didn't want to take too much time given the, the rest of the topics on the agenda. No, we appreciate that. Was there any questions from Mike and his team? Matt? I just put it in the chat uh, about the new bridge. Is that funded already, Jeff, or are we still looking for the money for that? No, the construction has not been funded yet. So um, we'll be reaching out and letting everybody know kind of what the status is. But uh, Mike, I think we're planning on um, submitting our application in November. Um, so that's that's kind of what the status is. Correct. Cool. And, and Jeff, is it fair to assume that uh, increased rail access to the West Complex provides greater opportunity for electrified loading um, and reduction of truck traffic? Is that, is that something I can hope for? Absolutely. Yes. Um, in fact, uh, yeah, we're talking about, you know, we've got one electric rail car mover now and we're, we're, we've had really good results from that. And so our team is pushing me to find funding for an additional um, one or two. So we are pushing that direction. So absolutely. All right. Wonderful. Thanks, Mike. Okay, uh, moving on. Um, the traffic study, as most of you probably are aware of, you know, one of our focuses is to try to get truck traffic out of the adjacent neighborhood. Um, the the extension of Highway Four to Navy Drive has really helped with a lot of that effort, but there is still some remaining truck traffic that is going down Fresno that is still a, a truck route um, right by the elementary school and into our e east complex. So. Uh, we've asked uh, Fair and Peers and Daiwoo is here to give us an update kind of on, on that study and different options we could identify to uh, alleviate truck traffic more through the neighborhood. So thanks, Daiwoo. Thanks, Jeff. Oh. Can you see the presentation? Yes. Excellent. So just a little bit of background first. Um, historically, the port access was provided through the SR4 South Fresno Avenue interchange. That's right here where my mouse is. Um, in 2017, the SR4 Crosstown connector was constructed and this diverted traffic from the West Complex to South Fresno. Um, this diverted West Complex tra tra traffic off of South Fresno Avenue and onto Navy Drive but the East complex remains. And you can see that um, all of the access to the East complex uses Fresno Drive still to access the port gate on Harbor Street, um, indicated in the, with the dark blue lines. Um, it's particularly challenging to get truck traffic out of the neighborhood because of jurisdictional boundaries. And the figure on the right, you'll see three different colors. Um, purple representing the Boggs Track community, which is an, in unincorporated San Joaquin County. Um, the city of Stockton surrounding it in the pink color, pinkish reddish color, um, representing the city of Stockton. And then you have the port on to the left. Um, we did traffic counts along the corridors and in the study area on Washington Street, Fresno and Harbor. 
um, approximately 50% of the traffic on South Fresno Avenue currently are trucks. When you look at the distribution of tra traffic by time of day on Fresno Avenue, um, the truck distribution is very similar to the vehicle distribution, meaning that when vehicles are on using South Fresno Avenue, so are the trucks. So you see the same sort of peak during the morning peak hour, the evening peak hour. And so it's not that trucks are coming during off peak periods, they're coinciding with periods when everyone else is using the road too. And this brings a problem to the elementary school adjacent to um, so on South Fresno Avenue adjacent to the truck route. So some of our key considerations, the port gate to the East complex is located in Harbor Street and is only accessible by traveling through Har Fresno Avenue or from downtown Stockton on Weber Avenue, which also has two schools, um, an alternative high school um, and another high school along that route. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the box track neighborhood is located in a particular unique position. It's in San Joaquin County, but also between the port gate and the cross connector. Um, truck routes, including STAA, uh, which is the really heavy duty trucks from the port can be redefined, but still must accommodate access to the industrial area. And that includes not just the port of Stockton, but some of the industrial developments adjacent to the port, such as Penny Newman Grain and some of the other industrial tenants that are located within the city of Stockton. Also, there's another level of complexity due to all the at-grade crossings in the area. So we've done some stakeholder outreach with the port, San Joaquin County, the city of Stockton. Uh, we did some community outreach with Bob Chuck's community members, including um, Washington Elementary School. Um, and then my colleague has done some outreach with the Port of Stockton tenants. And we've also done some outreach to industrial partners such as Penny Newman Grain. And the truck drivers will are a key stakeholder too. Um, so we have two sets of recommendations uh, that came out of the traffic study. So the short-term recommendations are interim improvements that would alleviate but not eliminate concerns related to truck access. And then we have a set of long-term improvements that would take tra traffic out of the neighborhood but require more infrastructure funding in order to construct. So the first two short-term recommendations, the first one is to revisit land use and zoning with the city of Stockton to, kind of, to rezone some of the parcels from residential from industrial to residential. And we spoke with the city on this and they seemed interested and on board. Um, the second item is to work with the city of Stockton and San Joaquin County to remove the designation of truck routes on West Washington Street. Um, now there is no reason for trucks to use West Washington Street un unless they, they want the shortest fastest path, but there are more circuitous um, non uh, pass between those destinations that don't require trucks to use West Washington Street. So the recommendation here is to restrict and undesignate that street as a truck access just between um, Ventura Avenue and South Fresno Avenue. You can see that here shown in red. And also the county recommended constructing some traffic calming devices such as curb extensions, sidewalks, um, traffic humps to discourage trucks from using this route. Um, when speaking to Penny Newman Grain, they also mentioned that one of the one of their key distributors at the port is moving locations. So uh, that would also reduce the number of truck trips going back and forth the port that use West Washington Street. Um, so as I mentioned earlier on the left diagram, you can see some of the tracks that we're recommending for rezoning. Um, the orange color represents industrial parcels and those with the slashed out white um, are, are empty parcels that could be rezoned. Um, some of them are not empty, so they weren't recommended for rezoning. Then we have our long-term recommendations. Um, there's three ideas. Uh, the first one is a diverter truck route to Ventura Avenue. And I'll go into detail about each of them later in the, in the next slide. Um, the next one is a bridge access from the West Complex. And the third one is direct access from the interchanges and the interstate freeway system. 
So on the diagram, um, there's a lot of information, but the first recommendation is the extended street from Ventura Avenue, and it's this middle box with the gray outline. Um, and in the zoom out or the zoom in, um, you can see Ventura Avenue would be extended to the north um, before the neighborhood area. Um, and it would go around the neighborhood, uh, creating a new route adjacent to the rail line, providing access to the East Complex Gate and eventually connecting to Harbor Street. Um, this alternative would require uh, coordination with the city of Stockton and San Joaquin County. And the realignment of Ventura Avenue would be constructed on the parcels west of Ventura Avenue near West Main Street. From the freeway system, from SR4 trucks could travel west on Navy Drive, east on West Washington Street, and north on Ventura Avenue to access the East Gate Complex. Although trucks would um, although trucks would remain on Ventura Avenue, most of the truck traffic would circumvent the box truck neighborhood. Along the new route, trucks would cross the railroad tracks on West Washington Street between Port Road 13 and Ventura Street. Um, we collected um, rail rail counts, um, two day, 24 hour train counts. There were a total of four, 46 train crossings during a two day period, or on average, 23 trains a day and the average crossing duration is three minute, uh, but this value is skewed due to infrequent long periods of blockage. Uh, the median train crossing time is actually only a minute and 22 seconds. The new route along Ventura Avenue is more circuitous. Uh, that's something that once some of our stakeholders brought up, so it would increase overall, it, it may increase overall truck greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so in our set of long-term recommendations, we are providing funding sources, not just for the infrastructure, but for zero emission vehicles and things to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the second alternative, uh, long-term alternative is bridge access from the West Complex. Um, a new collection was recently constructed providing grade separation between the railroad tracks and the trucks traveling into the West Complex. Um, the, railroad, the roadway north of the new connection, Five Street, was also realigned, which provides access to the historic Lindley House. And building a grade uh, bridge across the San Joaquin River and relocating the um, port gate to the other side of the east complex uh, would also get trucks going to the port out of the neighborhood. However, tenants like Penny Newman Grain and other industrial tenants really wouldn't have a way of getting to Harbor Street unless without taking Fresno Street unless re the first recommendation, the first long-term recommendation was also constructed. Um, the last one is more pie in the sky. Um, they, are re re they are currently reconstructing the I-10, I-5 Stockton Channel Viaduct Bridge right now. Um, and um, it's there used to be a direct off-ramp from I, southbound I-5 to the port of Stockton. Um, it was removed when the interchange was reconstructed. And so the recommendation would be to investigate new ways to reconnect and provide direct access into the port. So our next steps are to continue stakeholder engagement. There's still a couple stakeholders I think we have on our list um, and to also coordinate with the county and the city to implement short-term recommendations. Um, and to evaluate the feasibility of the long-term recommendations. Thank you. Any questions? Thanks, Dewu, appreciate that. There's a few things in the chat, but um, about sharing this presentation with folks, um, also making sure that Washington Elementary is engaged and, and I can assure you that that they are. We've gone over and met with them multiple times on many efforts, but this was one of the one of the focus points um, early on when we met with them. And Maria from the the CSC, the AB six one seven CSC, met with us as well. So okay, I don't see any hands up, so we can move on. Thank you very much. Appreciate that update. All right, Renee, um, the clean air plan, and we've been working on that. All of you have had input on that as well, and um, so wanted to have Renee come and give an, give an update on where we stand with the Clean Air Plan. 
Great. So um, as we had promised to you earlier, um, we are at the stage in the timeline where we are drafting the report that will be released for comment. Nothing in there should be a surprise to anyone here because we've been sharing the proposed strategies over the last year or so. The only thing that um, we wanted to maybe pick your brains about tonight is in terms of the implementation of these strategies. Many of these strategies are going to require additional evaluation, study, uh, program development. And in terms of the resources of the port, it, it's not going to be able to do everything at once. And so we wanted to get a sense from the community um, and the agencies and the industry partners, how should the port begin to prioritize some of these strategies? And, you know, even just some direction around specific uh, source categories, you know, are the trucks the biggest concern? Should the port start looking first at the truck strategies for implementation? Are ship emissions um, the biggest concern or harbor craft? Any kind of direction like that would be very helpful in terms of rolling out the implementation timeline. And I know we don't have a lot of time tonight because uh, we uh, have a really packed agenda, but if um, you had thoughts about that, if we have time to take a comment or two tonight, we can. If not, maybe email um, Jeff, or I'm happy to share my email address in the chat to just uh, provide some thoughts in terms of the prioritization of the strategies for implementation. And Renee, maybe one of the other things that will help is, you know, when we get the data from the, the emissions inventory, and I think that's for the for 2020, um, but I don't know if we're going to have that in time to have everything line up. But Jonathan, go ahead. Well, given the fact that there's anticipation for increased ships or barges, I, I would like to see more on the ship pollution. Um, Okay, that's great. That's helpful. And that is the biggest source of emissions for the port is the ship emissions, which is not unusual for a port. And no worries, the most complicated, but that's okay, Jonathan. We'll uh, <laughs> we'll dive right in. No, we 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 are working. You guys got James. That's James right. Mark, he can handle it. <laughs> All right, uh, Matt. Yeah, I, I think Jonathan's spot on there. Um, and then also, you know, I think it makes sense to wait for the inventory, but obviously if there's any sort of peculiar toxicity versus, you know, PM pollution, there'd be a lot of ways for us to go at prioritizing strategies to reduce air pollution. Um, and then, you know, I think there's also, you know, there's an inventory and then there's monitoring. And so I don't, I don't know what sorts of, if, if there's any vision to, you know, distribute or surface monitoring data. I know Valley Air Pollution is on the call and that there are some, you know, emissions monitoring data out there. Uh, and there are some things that you guys are going to have a hard time turning off. Uh, but if, it, if it's going to continue, then it should be disclosed and it should be part of, you know, giving people information about emission activity because there are, there are hotter and cooler times of day when pollution is closer to lung level. And so I think there's a lot of ways we can get creative around uh, communicating uh, emissions fluctuations to help people make more informed choices about outdoor activity. Um, so, but I think a lot of that waits for the inventory and then whether or not anybody's able to dig up real time emissions monitoring data, which is usually touchy to share because everybody's worried about cleaning the data and making sure that it's you know, uh, qualified publicly accessible data. But for, you know, advocates like myself, I don't really care about suing a company out of existence. I just want to warn a kindergarten to close their windows. So I think with, you know, emissions monitoring data, we can make behavioral choices and then they can clean the data later and find out if it was clumsy. You know, I don't worry about telling somebody to be extra careful and using the precautionary principle. Um, and so trying to been trying to do this a lot around multiple communities, that there is data, it just doesn't get to us because the regulatory framework doesn't allow for it. But I think we I think we have enough terrible outcomes in our community to get creative about surfacing data early and often in a preliminary health protective opportunity. So I don't, you know just put that out there. Much longer conversation, and certainly no point starting until we've at least seen the most recent inventory. Got oh, it. and I'll add one more thing. 
I know you got big cranes that missed the 2018 inventory. So I'm wondering if that's surprising data. If it's surprising? Well, yeah, they're big. They're big cranes. You know, and I, I, I mean, and maybe, and maybe they're, maybe they're big enough to prioritize for, I don't know if it's even possible to replace them or zero them out. We um, are, we actually have it in our budget, our five-year capital plan to take those to uh, electric um, to retrofit them. Oh wow, they're beautiful and brand new. So that's, that's they are. They are, and and they. I don't know. If this is a good thing, but they have also not been used a lot. So um, they look they look clean. <laughs> they they are, they are. Jeff okay. David Atwater, I got yes. a question. Sure. Uh, with regarding the the uh, 2020 inventory, the air inventory, um, probable COVID effects to that inventory. Uh, how will that skew the data? Well, that's a good point. I don't know, Renee, if, if you've heard any feedback from Randall. I have not specific to the Stockton inventory, but I will tell you that all of the port inventories that we've been doing, um, 2020 and 2021 were aberrations in terms of the emissions. There's a lot of congestion. Everyone knows the supply chain issues that happened. Um, so there were slumps and then there were big spikes in activity. Um, my guess is that Stockton, this is a 2020 emissions inventory, so maybe cargo was lower than expected, activity was lower than expected, but all of, all of sort of the context will be explained in the inventory itself. But yeah, the last two years of inventories for all of the seaports have been a little unusual. 2020 was, was, was stayed pretty consistent for us okay. um, as far as cargo volume. Um, the only the real difference is, you know, we didn't have a lot of uh, employees doing a lot of travel and back and forth. That was probably the biggest. But as far as cargo volume stayed up. Fern, you had a question? Or input on? Yeah, um, just a, a comment, really, which I think you um, and Matt actually alluded to already in terms of um, you talked about cranes. And I was going to bring up that I think cargo handling equipment as um, one of the main sources that um, is, you know, I think high opportunity here because the technologies and funding are available now. They're also much more in control of, um, of um, the port and the terminal operators to, um, to transition to zero emissions um, than harder to abate um, modes like um, ships, um, which is still really important because that does look like it's the biggest sources um, of emissions. Um, it's also what I'm seeing some of the other ports that I work with are focusing on right now, um, because there's not quite a, a rule, um, a state level rule coming down the pipeline. It's, it's a little bit further away, um, but everyone knows that we need to do something in the short term, and it just seems like a lower hanging fruit um, to be addressing cargo handling. Whereas, like with Harbourcraft, um, CARB just passed a rule um, to make those cleaner. So, in a way, that's um, going to be addressed by um, by the the new regulation. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what we're seeing come out of our, our blueprint, the kind of the early preliminary feedback. Go ahead, Renee, sorry. Yeah, no, I think that's right. I mean, figuring out how to roll out the implementation of these strategies, is it's a little bit of a mix of, okay, what are the most pressing emission issues, which is ships for almost every seaport, they're the largest source of emissions, but they're also the source that we have the least control over, so they're hard to get at. And so you do have to sort of balance, you know, what, what CARB is doing and regulations that we can accelerate, but also what the port is able to do on its own. Um, so when, when we release the draft, you'll, you'll sort of see that attempt to balance, you know, the, the needs to reduce emissions from big sources, but then also what we can do in the near term, because I think you know, the port is committed to moving as expeditiously as possible on all of it. All right, thank you very much. We've got to move on. Appreciate that, Renee. Um, so wonderful. Uh, I think we've been talking a little bit uh, in the past about 
you know, the port and being uh, engaged in kind of workforce development and how can we, um, you know, especially right now we're seeing a, a real lack of support for some of our new zero emission equipment and whether it's finding uh, um, folks who can come out and work on them um, or, you know, whatever the case may be, we, we see a lack of, of uh, workforce development opportunities and, and, and being able to guide folks from high school, you know, let them come out and see things that are happening at the port and different job opportunities, get them excited about their future and about um, what they need to focus on to, to get some of the great jobs that are, that are at the port. And so we've been talking to um, SUSD uh, quite a bit. We've signed an MOU with them to work together to develop a workforce development program. And so Krista is going to give an update on kind of where we stand, where we are, and um, uh, things that we're looking forward to in the future. Yes, thank you. I don't know what happened. I just got kicked off, but I'm so glad I was able to get back right on. Um, Krista Van Est, and I'm your work-based learning coordinator from Stockton Unified School District, and I work in the CTE division with Nathan Haley. I think Nathan's going to jump on here shortly as well. Um, Karen, if you'll advance the slides for us. So one of the words that we use in our um, educational uh, jargon is um, we talk about pathways and pathways is an area that we are uh, very, we have a strong pathways in our district. We have over 45 different pathway areas for our students to look into their interests and hopefully guide them to the career path that they can find a variety of jobs and jobs that would be um, entry level and then more advancement. And then obviously the, the goal is to make sure that they are productive citizens that have a lifestyle sustaining kind of um, job or career path that they can continue to grow in. And so um, we'll share with you some of our resources. You can find all of our career paths are on our uh, district website. And uh, Karen, if you'll advance this one. Um, we've got several ways that our students can engage with our career exploration. And so in our K-5 and 6 to 8, we have um, some more, uh, they're more virtual opportunities. They're opportunities where we're learning about, we're introducing careers, we're thinking about what that looks like. Um, in the K-8, in the 6-8, we're looking at Project Lead the Way where they're starting to think about working the working together as a team, what are those soft skills that we need to develop to be able to approach a project, problem solve, work with others, develop a plan. When we find that that plan isn't working, how do we adjust? How do we um, improve it and uh, continue to um, develop the solution? And then where we focus or where my focus primarily is, is gonna be in grades nine through 12 and beyond. So we're looking to try and help those students to really see the opportunities there are. And my goal is to get students to engage with more work-based learning opportunities where we are having them and getting to see guest speakers, getting to talk to industry partners or hear from our industry partners. Maybe they're engaged in a job shadow and the internships are the things we'd like to connect with the port as well. Uh, but through our pathway, looking for those students that are that are really engaged with that curriculum, they're really finding this is something that they wanna do and now they're internship ready. And so our teachers in those pathways, um, are they are the ones also that are looking at what our industry looks like. They are reaching out and needing their partners. Um, they, they, they need to know what's relevant in the industry. So maybe what they were teaching um, five years ago or teaching even two years ago, it needs an update and needs to refresh. And so our advisory committee is committees are ways that we also um, look for our industry partners to help guide us. Um, if we're teaching a particular software or a particular skill, um, let's say in our engineering classes or in our um, construction classes, and that's not something that's even used by the industry anymore, we want to, our partners to be able to tell us that so that we can revise and stay relevant with what kind of skills we're bringing our students. Um, the teachers themselves also, we are looking for externships and that may be a, a funky word, but what an externship is, is it's an internship for a teacher. So while an internship for a student is exciting because that student gets to try out the job, 
that's one student where an externship with a teacher that teacher teaches in the pathway they get a chance to then engage with this industry partner maybe they work 10 hours maybe they work for 50 hours maybe they work for over the por- course of the year they do a couple hours throughout the different um seasons or or um times of the year where that's busier and or even times of the year when it's not and then they take that industry knowledge and that industry relevance back to their classroom and they affect 150 to 200 students a year over and over year after year so trying to find ways that we can make sure that we're bringing the industry that we're bringing that relevance to our students our curriculum and trying to help connect students with what's next what are they going to do with their lives and what are they going to to do that inspires them in their career path. And hopefully that involves additional trainings. It might involve additional education. And we want to be here to support that for them. Um, I know, I believe you'll be sharing this um, presentation. And so that link there just takes you right to our uh, pathway page where you can look at the different pathways. We actually have two different pages. One is broken down by pathway. So if you're specifically looking for like logistics or agriculture, you can find those pathways and what schools have those pathways. And then we have another page that's broken down by school. So if you specifically want to know what Stag High School has or what Chavez offers, you can see their listings and the breakdown of those um, pathways that are offered at each site. It is not necessarily equally distributed. So some of our sites have big pathways that that serve the whole or serve all of that site, but there's maybe only four or five options. And then others have lots of options and lots of different varieties. So our job also is looking to how we can bring those pathways that need to be um, enhanced or or improved or brought to our um, our area and get those built um, and teachers in place to start allowing students to understand that. Karen, if you're ready to move, I'm ready. Um, this one, we, we want to talk in that pathway. One of the things that um, I, I relate this to being a scoreboard um, in a sports game and on the scoreboard, you want to get points on the board. And so if you haven't heard of it yet, it's called the California dashboard. And the California dashboard is the scoreboard for all schools, every school and every district gets a scoreboard and you only get points on there by completing certain tasks. And so one of the areas of ours uh, scoreboard that we're focused on is called the CCNR. That is not Credence Clearwater Revival. It is the College and Career Readiness Standards. So CCNR, um, they are ways that we want our students to, the, the point of getting the students to go through a pathway is that we're going to get points at the end, but we're getting points because we're doing the job we're supposed to be doing for students. In this regard, uh, one way we can get students to have a point on the board, if you will, is if they complete a pathway. So our, our pathways are all two course pathways. We have a few that are three course, but those are more unique. We only have a couple that do that. So a two course pathway would start at that concentrator level you see here on the, the darker green there. They're going to start at concentrator and then the capstone class is going to be their second course. So when students complete course one and course two, they will be considered a program completer. And that is something that once, once they have a program completer, we don't get a point yet. Well, we have to do what it's an and. We have one more thing we need to do. We need to either connect them maybe to a college course or maybe they have an articulation or a dual enrollment. And if they do complete a college course, that's going to get us a CCR point, college and career ready. The other way we might get it, another way is that we might have them involved in an internship. If that student has completed an internship or an apprenticeship, that counts as a CCNR, a, co- a completer, and we'll get that point for them as well. So not only do we get the point, they complete the pathway because that's important that we know that they're sticking with the pathway, they're choosing one and, and moving through that pathway to learn and develop their skill, but they're also engaging in some sort of work-based learning or college readiness. Um, And so that we're trying to have some of our classes, many of our classes are articulated. You can see there, San Joaquin Delta College is one of our big partners. They're not our only partner, but they are a big partner because they're right here in the backyard. 
Many of our students are involved in CTSOs, which is, stands for Career Technical Student Organization. You might be familiar with words like FFA or Skills USA competitions. And that's usually where it's an opportunity for students to have leadership roles. They might be in some sort of competition or a leveling up of their skills where they're doing that um, outside of class time, in, in addition to class time, but also outside of class time. And, and we are encouraging all of our um, sites to make sure they have some sort of offering um, on campus that our students can be engaged in a CTSO. And then, of course, we want to see them to be engaged in some sort of trade or um, additional training certification programs, or if they're continuing their education at one of our community colleges or universities. We have so many partners right here in the area. They don't even have to leave this area to get their education completed. So any of those ways that our students are engaging, those are kind of goals that we have for getting points on the board, if you will. And that's how we measure that we are doing, we're serving the needs of our students in that we're engaging them in all of these different activities to hopefully give them a wide view of opportunities that are out there. And hopefully they find something in there. They'll probably find some things they don't like, which is also important, find what you don't like, but then also to find some of the areas and kind of get them in a, in a path for a career, a job that will help them pay bills and a lifestyle that they wanna have. Karen, if you'll switch the slide. So um, this is just a, a, a smattering here, as you can see, of the listing of those different pathway areas. So some of these connect up with the uh, part industry partners and the tenants there, that, that all of you that are connected here to the port. Some of them don't, and that's all right too. We, we don't need to have a one size fits all. We're looking though for the areas that our partners can uh, participate with us. So agriculture, arts and media, um, meaning like our we have graphic arts, multimedia, um, students are involved in video production, so they're it, in, within arts and media, it breaks down into some other um, subcategories. Uh, with our building trades, we are working closely with um, the construction trade unions, MC3, um, also working with our non-union partners to try and, and help our students to understand the valuable careers there are in the trades. If any of you have had to have any repairs, <laughs> you know how important it is and vital that we have folks that value the trades and um, take those careers very seriously. They are very lucrative and um, very lifestyle sustaining. Um, we have a business pathway, education pathway. I don't need to read them all. You can read those for yourself, but you can see that you might fit into one or more of those pathways. And we're asking those teachers to start to recognize or identify for me students that are industry and internship ready. So I have a list. I have about 35 students on the list now, and some will fit into um, positions that you may have, and some maybe aren't quite a good fit yet, but I'd like to find those matchups that we can um, and connect those students that are ready to go and experience um, some sort of a job experience or work-based learning opportunity there with you at the port. Uh, we have these are I listed our schools for you as well. Sometimes it may seem um, overwhelming to keep track of all these schools, but we have our four comprehensive, which are probably pretty um, evident for you. They're they're the bigger a comprehensive school has you know all of the they offer every support service and and they offer usually sports and other activities, extracurricular activities. Our special academies don't necessarily always offer those because they are a place that a student would select. Um, to participate in that because they know already that's a pathway they want to work on, like our Health Careers Academy or at Weber Technology. We have automotive is at our Weber Technology, is at Weber Tech. So students that know they want to work in automotive technology would select to go to Weber. Uh, computer technology is there as, as well. That's not the only thing they offer, but we have environmental op options are at uh, Merlot Institute of Environmental Technology. So each of those areas has different focuses kind of based on the populations that are there. And uh, we try to make sure when you, when you look at Pacific law, that's legal, not they're, they're not trying to necessarily look at law enforcement, more like legal options and legal um, professions, professions in law. And I can, we can move off that one as well. So what are the ways that we can get involved? These are the ways that we can get involved. So work-based learning has so many different um, faces, if you will. It could be a guest speaker, and a guest speaker can be virtual. It can be in person. Uh, we could do it also as like a um, class. It could be a small classroom presentation. We can also do them at our career center with a larger audience, inviting the whole student body that was interested, wants to sign up and come 
um, participate and hear more about this particular area or career option. Uh, field trips are starting to be more and more readily available and we'd love to do one. I got, you got some pictures here of our students that went to Caltrans District 10. We got to get that field trip on the books last year and boy, did it open their minds and their eyes as to the opportunities that are right here in their backyard of really good opportunities for careers, advancements, um, and, and life-sustaining uh, salaries, benefits, retirement, things that a lot of these teenagers don't always think about right now, but we need to help them think about that to plan for that future. I want them to pay taxes someday so that I can retire too. So we, we all need them. <laughs> uh, job shadows is probably the, I call this the gateway drug. Uh, the easiest way to get us um, connected because we're not talking about a big commitment with a job shadow we're looking at, at one day maybe even a half day uh, setting up one student with one person that's willing to mentor that student for the day have them along as a shadow and learning about what they're doing um, seeing what the job entails and from there if that's something that works out well we can look at other opportunities so that might be the starting point for you as well if that's something that you're interested in we want to make these things happen and I, I teachers are emailing me regularly I'd like a field trip I'd like a guest speaker what can I do in these areas so as soon as I hear from an industry partner I want to connect you up and that's what I'll be doing in in, uh, in this role um, mock job interviews come up in the spring for us and we'll actually have some in December as well because several of our well actually all of our freshmen are enrolled in a class called get focused stay focused some of our schools will actually end their year their their term they'll have a, a fall and a spring semester they'll have two semesters and a class will end in December and then other there's other sites that will have classes that end um, and complete and the students are year-long enrolled either one the culminating event in that get focused, stay focused class for all of our ninth graders is a mock job interview. And having an industry person that's not me, it's not a teacher or a staff member that they know, some stranger, makes all the difference for the students to really turn on their A game, practice those soft skills we've been learning, tell you about themselves and how their skills might apply to the job that they are applying to, the, the fake job. Um, this is a great opportunity for feedback for them as well. Hey, you know, you're touching your hair too much or, or you're fidgeting with your knee. Let's, and, and maybe they didn't even know you were, they were doing it, but hearing it from a stranger, in this case, someone that's an industry representative, helps them to really take to heart what their teacher's been saying all year long. Oh, I really do move my arms too much when I talk or whatever that one may be. We're going to be having some hiring fairs coming up. We're organizing those and we want to let you all know about those and invite you to join us for any of those opportunities. We're looking at some on campus and also some um, connecting with uh, Delta College as well. Um, we'll be looking, of course, for college tours and mentoring with our students, internships, as I mentioned, the externships, which is for teachers, apprenticeships and any community service activities you might be having as well. Some of our Health Career Academy students help out with uh, blood drives and um, CPR trainings, things like that. So if there's something that we can connect to. Um, I did include that link in there if you did want to check it out. Caltrans did make a video um, and our, many of our students are, are featured on there um, as we were checking out all the different parts there at, um, at Caltrans. It's a great field trip and a neat partnership. And we're looking forward to being able to add our experience with the port and all of its partners um, as well. Oh, I'm running over time, no problem. I'm done. So here you go as the interest form. Let me know if you have anything that you want to um, maybe engage in, if you're willing to. Um, hopefully this QR code is corrected and the form works, but we'd love to hear from you and I want to match you up with a student. And if there's questions, uh, please feel free. Um, that goes to me as well. And my email was, I think, on the very first slide. Um, if the, I can stop for any questions too. Thank you, Krista. Appreciate that. Yeah, and so you know the port we 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 have about 120 jobs that we provide, but um, you know all of our our tenants and business partners, uh, you know we're trying to play matchmaker to some degree to bring them to the table to be able to work with you as well. So um, I don't see any hands, but uh, if I will, we'll get this information to everybody attending and our other tenants, um, and so hopefully you'll be hearing back and and we can match you up with some folks. And oh, so there's some you. in the chat. I need to grab that. Okay. Okay. Thank you and thank uh, Nathan as well. All thank right. You, Jeff. Sorry, for some reason, my, my camera is not working, but um, I appreciate you having us on today. Absolutely. Good to, good to hear from you.
Okay. All right, moving on, our last and not least uh, presenter who's here to get everybody fired up about providing information and uh, and being a part of our, our outreach efforts uh, and stakeholder engagement for our blueprint uh, is James Dumont from um, Momentum. Thanks, Jeff. Great hype man. Uh, good <laughs> evening, everybody. James Dumont from Momentum, director of Ports and Fleets, like I said earlier. Uh, we are working with the Port of Stockton to develop the medium and heavy duty electrification blueprint in partnership with Starcrest and Rebel Marketing. Um, this is funded by the California Energy Commission with a grant that we applied for, gosh, was this 2019 or 2020, but quite a while ago. Uh, it took a long time to get awards and contracts, but uh, as you'll see in a couple slides, uh, we are underway now and uh, looking to complete this in the winter of uh, this coming winter. Uh, next slide, please, Karen. Thank you. A uh, quick agenda, overview of the blueprint goals and milestones, uh, overview of the stakeholder groups, and the review of the project fact sheet. Uh, we are going to send out the project fact sheet to everybody that joined on the call today, or it may have already gone out, uh, just so you have the full two-page document that gives an overview of what we're up to with this blueprint and the goals and objectives of it, and sort of an overview of the process and the benefits we expect to achieve. Uh, and then I'll close out with a brief conclusion and next steps. Uh, next slide, please, Karen. Okay, goals and milestones. Uh, so really the ultimate goal of this project is to accelerate the adoption and deployment of dev infrastructure at the Port of Stockton, uh, including evaluating opportunities to electrify the local trucking uh, drainage operations. Um, through this project, we're gonna develop an instructional electrification guide uh, based upon actual dev deployments. This is kind of uh, in large part building upon the Port Community Electric Vehicle Blueprint the Port of Long Beach developed uh, back in 2018. Uh, and looking to tailor this to be really looking at the break bulk and conventional cargo operations that happen at the port. Uh, we'll also be looking at some aspects of the M580 project uh, to see where that can be utilized to uh, help reduce emissions from cargo movement in, from the Bay Area into Northern California, the Central Valley. Um, ultimately, the project is looking to facilitate the evaluation, design, and deployment of ZEVs and ZEV infrastructure. Uh, we have pro uh, some of the scope of work is actually uh, nearly complete uh, along designing infrastructure, and there is a, a fleet assessment proce uh, process that has been undertaken uh, with leadership from Starcrest and Renee, who was on the call earlier. Uh, and we have already started developing some uh, infrastructure plans and designs for future cargo hand equipment electrification, as well as drainage operations. Uh, really, to make this successful, it will require co cooperation and collaboration. As you'll see through the stakeholder groups in the coming slide, uh, we do intend to uh, undertake a lot of out to gather feedback, understand where people view the industry today, uh, as well as the state of technology, and what are some of the opportunities, challenges, barriers, uh, and benefits of this electrification transition. Uh, and then at the end, really looking to encourage knowledge and resource sharing. This blueprint is meant to be replicable uh, to other ports and industries. Uh, and luckily, if you're not aware of the CEC medium heavy blueprints, the California Energy Commission funded something to the tune of 35 or, or more of these blueprints covering a broad range of industries from uh, regular, your, your traditional municipalities and cities on through to concrete ind industries, uh, other ports, logistics providers, all sorts of industries are covered uh, by various partners throughout the state. Uh, so there will be a lot of differing blueprints that can be leveraged to influence, uh, to guide future planning as well as investments into various electrification efforts. And I say when really broadly electrification should be called decarbonization or even zero emissions. Uh, so our milestones, uh, we don't have the months in here yet, but on the future slide you'll see the dates. Uh, the project kickoff was, I believe, back in March of this year. Uh, and then we've been at, went through a planning phase for a couple of months, and we're now in the stakeholder engagement phase. Uh, through that, we actually have a developed a long slew of questionnaire materials. Uh, we have about 140 various questions to understand where various stakeholders are and their understanding of the technology pathways and where they see the future for them. Uh, don't worry if you get this, if you're, when you are invited to participate in the survey, uh, you won't get all 140 questions. Some of them are very much 
relegated to specific stakeholder groups, whereas others are more broadly applicable. Um, after we wrap the stakeholder engagement process in about a month and a half, two months, we'll then start analyzing the results and then start getting into reporting the final submission uh, to wrap it and then wrap up the project. Next slide, please, Karen. Excellent. Uh, so we've broken out nine stakeholder groups at a high level, uh, with some of these actually being broken down into subsets. Uh, so these include utilities like Pacific Gas and Electric, as well as the port, uh, recognizing that the West Complex is uh, under the Ports Utility Authority. Uh, regional jurisdictions and planning organizations, that will be uh, local government organizations, the local air districts, and things like that. Uh, port tenants, businesses, owners, and operators. Uh, looking, we've already started engaging some of the tenants and are continuing that process um, and looking forward to more engagement. Uh, regional community-based organizations, so we'll be reaching out to many of you on this call and really targeting those at the AB 617 steering committee uh, to gather their feedback and insights uh, and make sure that this pro planning effort is inclusive of all the needs of the community uh, as best as we are able. Uh, and then also looking to community leaders and local residents. Uh, we'll be talking to local American, uh, California Native American tribes, uh, of course, the port board employees uh, and others. Uh, financial institutions, that will be some of the regulatory agencies that act as our funding partners uh, to enable the zero emission transition, as well as traditional finance organizations to understand if there are new energy as a service, trucking as a service, uh, other service models that enable to amortize the cost, the upfront cost to into a lifetime OPEX cost to reduce the overall burden of making this transition. Uh, and then we'll also be reaching out to technology vendors. That is one of the groups that really gets broken out into the diverse subsets from the charging station manufacturers, the various net charging network operators, hydrogen fuel producers and station filling station technologies, as well as microgrids and solar uh, renewable energy developers. Uh, so looking to really understand what the state of technology is, what the prices are, uh, and what the path pathway to coming into cost parity with existing technologies looks like, uh, and also understanding what their technology readiness is to really enable a, uh, a cost-effective but also functional uh, transition to zero emission technologies that doesn't risk impacting operations. Um, and I believe that covers all the stakeholders. Um, next slide, please, Karen. Um, so this is the overview of the fact sheet. We only have room to paste the first part of the first page uh, on here. Uh, but as I said, you should be receiving a, a full copy of the two-page project fact sheet, uh, but ultimately looking to leverage the knowledge contained within the port as well as our stakeholders that will be engaging to understand how we can leverage ongoing demonstrations and knowledge gained through that and develop an actionable replicable, seri replicable series of steps uh, to be undertaken by a small port or public utility public and private adoption of medium and heavy duty zero emission vehicles. Uh, the focus is really on medium and heavy duty, but we also are looking at some of the workforce charging opportunities, or sorry, workplace charging opportunities um, to enable the decarbonization of those, uh, of the commutes. Uh, so ultimately the blueprint is going to be a roadmap to decarbonization. Uh, and one of the aspects of that is what we are calling a flexible adaptations pathway, which will analyze the various states of technology readiness, cost, et cetera, of various fueling and zero emission charging infrastructure technologies uh, that will help us make uh, at various stages of those technology and price development or evolution pathways, understand which one might be the most appropriate to pursue at any given time. Uh, and then ultimately the, pro the project will support development microgrids, uh, hydrogen production and utilization, electrification of industrial processes, and supporting combined heat and power systems at the port. And we will result, this will result in the port and our stakeholders gaining valuable insights into the planning, design, construction, and operation of medium heavy duty ZEVs and their supporting infrastructure. Uh, next slide, please. This might be the end slide. Conclusion indeed. Uh, so here's our schedule, as you see, uh, oh, project kickoff was in uh, January and planning was up until May. So I was just off by a month or two uh, away. And as I said, the data analysis and collect uh, data analysis will really kick off a really complete in fall of this year. 
uh, with the final report being published this winter. Uh, I believe, next slide, Karen, please. Just to say thank you. Thank you for your time, everybody. Uh, if you have any questions, of course, reach out to myself or Jeff. I realized I didn't put my email on the slide deck, uh, but you can get my email through Jeff or Karen, and we do look forward to reaching out to you all and getting your insights and feedback as we complete this process. Um, I have time to take questions. Uh, Jeff, I guess you're the master of ceremony, so what's your time clock saying? Time clock is saying uh, time's up, but uh, if there are one or two questions, that's fine. I don't see any hands or anything, and typically they come up early, and I don't see much in the chat. So, but no, we really appreciate it, um, and, and everybody on the, everybody here at this meeting will probably be getting an invite for the uh, the stakeholder engagement process. So, and some of our tenants we've already started um, with them. We've had a good first meeting. So, um, and I'm working on James hard to pair those 140 questions down to something a little bit more manageable. So hopefully it won't be too painful. <laughs> We're aiming it for about 30 questions per stakeholder group, ideally. Uh, yeah. So it shouldn't be as big a lift for everybody. Great. All right. Well, thank you guys. Appreciate it. Uh, we'll be having an agenda setting meeting. We'll send out uh, some information about that. If you're interested in talking to us and, and providing input and, and providing thoughts about what uh, what you want to see out of these meetings. Um, uh, we also, one of the things that we got feedback from Catholic Charities is on having somebody come and talk about carbon capture and sequestration. So we're reaching out to find out uh, who we can have come speak about uh, that new endeavor and that push in California, uh, as well as we'll have SSA who's demonstrating some zero emission truck um, uh, well, I guess it's about a dozen trucks that they're demonstrating between Tracy and Oakland. So we wanted to get, have them come in and provide an update as well. So, and that is all we have. Thank you guys for, for being here tonight. We appreciate your input and your support, and uh, we will see you next month. Thanks, everybody.